Hi everyone, welcome back again to Social Media Law and Risk Management. We're into Module 3, Lecture 1, and we're looking at issues of identity in social media use and moderation. And for this we're using the textbook Chapter 4, Identity, Anon Anonymity and Deception. We also have the extension reading on keeping secrets uh, for those of you who want to delve deeper from Pearson and Polden's 5th edition, The Journalist's Guide to Media Law. Well, let's look at what we're covering today, your learning problem, which is a new one, this module, and it's where we always start. We look at the topics of your real name, a nom de plume, a pen name, or a nom de guerre, which is a war name, a battle name. We look at platform, terms of service and rules, a hosting of other people's material in user-generated content, which I know a lot of you do in the organisations in which you work. The notion of astroturfing and uh, using social media as a weapon of change. Duties to disclose users by platforms internationally. And we finish with our usual discussion questions. Well, what's our learning problem this module? Well, this time we're looking at you as a drug company PR, a big pharma, big pharmaceuticals company. You're the communications manager of a, a leading pharmaceutical company facing financial ruin. The company is facing financial ruin because the sales of your leading cholesterol-lowering drug, Coldrop, have plummeted now. Now that the patent has run out and generic brands are flooding the market at less than half the price of the original version of the drug. And there are also rumours around that the drug, Coldrop, could have some side effects. Your new company president has a strong sales background in another country, but is not very familiar with the laws in your jurisdiction. He returns from a long lunch with the president of a national pharmacy warehouse franchise, a big chemist discounter, and sends you the following email. Quote, Top secret. Desperate times demand desperate measures. We have negotiated an arrangement with Cheapest Chemist Corp to obtain all customer details from their prescription database so we can conduct a direct mail and social media campaign to all their patients with high cholesterol levels, reassuring them about the safety and superiority of our product. We also instruct all senior staff to destroy all copies of the privately commissioned Unimed research report uh, reporting a higher risk of stroke for patients taking cold drop. End quote. End of email. Now this doesn't feel right to you, but you are loath to point this out because you fear for your position if you are seen to be a troublemaker. Coincidentally, a lifelong friend of yours, a former doctor, is now an investigative health reporter with a national daily newspaper. You are friends on Facebook and you follow each other on Twitter. So you are tempted to message her the document confidentially to ask her advice about all this. You also consider setting up a fake Twitter account at Medleak, at Medleak to get the word out to the public. Well, we now put all of our normal questions to this scenario. And I can give you a reasonable hint here. The material in that covers both weeks of this module, so uh, you'll, you'll cover both the identity issues and some privacy and confidentiality issues there. You need to link this with your social media law understanding, your stakeholder theory, and risk management. So good luck with all of that. That's a backdrop to our class today. Get onto the discussion board and start talking about it. And so onto the content for identity. Your real name or nom de guerre? Lessons from the gay girl in Damascus. 
Well, it seems a long time ago in history now that uh, there was this so-called gay girl in Damascus. And it's detailed in the textbook. But essentially, uh, the idea was there was a girl who was, um, who was stranded there in Damascus. Uh, there was a Twitter account set up there. People were concerned for her safety amid the civil unrest there. Uh, the fears that she was being taunted over her sexuality. And as you read in the text, it all turned out to be a fake story set up by an American middle-aged man living in the UK. So the whole media swallowed this story. Uh, it was only very late in the piece. A few journalists started to get a little bit suspicious about the gay girl in Damascus. But nevertheless... The story had been running for some time, and it was all a spoof. It links very closely to taking on fake identities on social media. Perhaps you already have one. And the big question is, do you use your real name, or do you use a nom de plume, a pen name, or perhaps even a nom de, de guerre, a, a name of battle, to go to war for some cause or against some individual? Well, in the text and in your reading, we, we look at various uh, pros and cons of using a false name or a false identity. And, you know, th th there are several, of course. The ones that spring to mind, the, the pros, are that, you know, in some places people are not safe to use social media and speak the truth uh, under their real name. So you'll find some parts of the world where if you don't use a fake name and, and have very good encryption and, and security, then you may be arrested and jailed, perhaps even tortured or murdered for speaking your mind or speaking the truth. So some kind, some, sometimes can be very good reasons. At a lesser level, in Western democracies, it might be a matter of not getting the sack from your job. We learned in our earlier eco-warrior uh, example, uh, a practice learning problem, that that was in fact what someone did from within a government job. She finished up losing that job, but uh, nevertheless she had tried to do her social media under a fake name uh, in the process. And that was the Banerjee case, which proved to be a dismissal that was upheld as a, a fair dismissal in the Australian courts. The cons of using a fake name uh, are many. Uh, you can leave yourself liable to, uh, to litigation, uh, particularly if others disclose who you are. It's very hard to cover your tracks. The surveillance state that we live in means that IP addresses and all sorts of other metadata, as well as surveillance techniques, allow people who think they're operating anonymously to actually be identifiable to the authorities and to other litigants who might come pursuing them. But another um, problem with uh, using a fake name can be that you might lose some of your defences to defamation, for example. If you are being fake, you're not the actual person, for example, holding the belief. It's a fake person that's holding the belief. So it would be very difficult to run a fair comment or an honest opinion defence on the basis that you honestly believe something that a fake identity was saying. Nevertheless, um, spoof accounts can be fun. We've seen fun ones created over the years, uh, but we've also seen some very damaging ones. There are certain procedures recommended in, in the textbook and in the literature for revealing or reporting an imposter. And these apply at both the platform level. Most of the um, social media platforms have protocols for flagging someone as a false identity, which they then look into and might disable an account. But also um, at a legal level and, and various regulatory authorities also have reportage uh, methods. And we found uh, that the transparency reports issued by the various platforms uh, show that Thousands of identities and, and metadata material uh, is revealed by the main social media platforms to governments throughout the world every year. And uh, if you just search for uh, 
transparency reports and your favourite social media platform, then you'll find their most recent report and you'll see that governments uh, have been given all sorts of information. Your platform terms of service or rules or terms of use uh, typically require you to register an account as you. Now, this means you use your real name and you only have a single account. There are exceptions to this, of course. Um, you know, typically someone uses an innovative name, for example, on Twitter, and, uh, but they are expected to register under their real name but have the, um, the, the Twitter handle as something funny and perhaps anonymous if they choose. Facebook, and you can see the, their terms of service there on the, on the page, and it clearly says that uh, you will not provide uh, person, fake personal information on Facebook, create an account for anyone other than yourself, and you won't create more than one personal account, and that you must provide your real names and information. Now, we all know, of course, many, many people ignore all of this and are never found out. But be aware that if you're doing that, that your account could be disabled by the platform at a moment's notice um, if you are breaking these rules. Of more pertinent uh, use and, and relevance to you as an organisational communicator, particularly in a crisis communication situation, is when you are hosting material posted by other people to your various sites. Now, there are differences in host liability between the United States and Australia. In America, there is the uh, Communications Decency Act, at which Section 230 gives immunity to people hosting the comments of others uh, from litigation over those comments that the other people have made. So there is this um, host immunity that it's afforded to the social media platforms and to internet service providers in the US. In Australia, however, and in some other places, uh, the case law has developed so that you do not have such an immunity. If you are from an organisation or a company, then you are responsible for the comments of other people on the sites for which you, uh, you take responsibility. Well, what does this mean? Well, it, there was a consumer law case that's mentioned in your book, the Allergy Pathway case. You can look it up there with that citation. And uh, in that case, a federal court judge in Australia uh, decided that a company was responsible and it should have taken down, within a reasonable time, comments posted by third parties that were in breach of consumer law. They were making false and misleading statements about a product. So what does all this mean? It means that in your organisation, you have to set up systems so that you are checking social media, and particularly Facebook, uh, regularly if you have a corporate site uh, set up around that uh, for the comment stream that's, that's, that's going there. Unfortunately, with Facebook, as the technology stands, comments must be either fully turned on or fully turned off. And the idea of organisations having them is to have some sort of engagement and discourse with the community. So you would need to be really checking those comments regularly. There is an argument that in very serious things that people say that a reasonable time would, not be, would be too long. Say, for example, someone jumped onto your Facebook page and said that a prominent community citizen uh, was a child molester. Well, what's a reasonable time for that to remain on your Facebook page? One would imagine zero time is reasonable for that to be staying there. And we've yet to have a court case decide what's reasonable time for something so heinous to remain there. For your website, uh, you can moderate comments. So I would suggest you have the comment moderation on so that all comments are cleared before they're actually posted to a website. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm an academic working in the area, so you would talk to a lawyer seeking legal advice about that sort of matter. There is the area of uh, astroturfing and social media campaigns. We don't have a lot of time to look at that today, but um, in the area of crisis communication, uh, you can have the, the, er the, um, 
fake grassroots campaigns creating the impression that there are large numbers of people that are demanding or opposing policies. You can also have quite legitimate social media protest campaigns and we saw that with that second example there from Destroy the Joint where a major commercial radio network was basically frozen for several days because its advertisers had been bombarded through a social media campaign over its misogynist, its anti-women statements on air. There is a duty on platforms to disclose their users, and uh, these vary according to different uh, jurisdictions. We call an anonymous user a John Doe or a Jane Doe, an anonymous person. And uh, the casework is patchy here. In some uh, jurisdictions, there have been some decisions where uh, companies have been ordered to reveal anonymous users, and in others, they have um, been excused from not revealing them. In the US, normally the First Amendment will kick in and give them protection from having to reveal um, their, their users. In the UK, there is, uh, from a, a 1970s case, Norwich Pharmacal, there is uh, pretty much a presumption that companies, if something, if very bad behaviour has been taking place or someone's rights have been very badly damaged, that companies should disclose the anonymous uh, correspondence. But as we've already heard, transparency reports show that uh, platforms cooperate with governments without a court requirement. So there's a strong chance they'll be revealing much of this data. What are our discussion questions this week? Well, what's the use of terms of service requiring disclosure when so many people break them? What are some really good reasons for using a fake ID and some equally good reasons for not using one? I've, I've listed some, but you might talk on the discussion board about some other ideas you have there. What are the main legal risks facing someone using a fake ID on social media? And to what extent would your own social media policy at your organisation tolerate the use of fake identities by users? Well, where have we been today? We've looked at the positives and negatives of identity issues and, uh, and looked at some legal cases where they have been involved. We've also looked at the different international approaches on whether disclosure is required of uh, social media platforms and internet service providers um, revealing anonymous users. Next week, we're looking at the big ticket items of privacy and confidentiality, very important areas affecting social media. So start talking about the learning problem on the discussion board and chatting about those uh, discussion questions and taking some notes on all of this for your learning journals. And don't forget to jump onto social media to our hashtag MLGriff to talk on social media about these social media law issues. See you next week.